Hi, my name is James, and in this video, I'm going to be talking about the Power Dots of Thrift. So I just let me adjust my camera there a bit so it fits it all in. Okay, so uh, whilst I'm talking about the Power Dots of Thrift, I'm also going to be going through some stuff that's on uh, A level economic syllabuses. So I'm going to be talking about the base rate, uh, what the base rate is, and monetary policy. Uh, I'm going to have a quick look at aggregate supply and also briefly explain what negative externalities are at the end of the video in context of the paradox of thrift. So, first of all, the basic idea of the paradox of thrift is that if everyone tries to save more money, then the demand for goods and services falls in the economy and this leads to lower income. So, people have less money to save, so they're worse off. Um, they're, at, they're worse off than they're than the, uh, if they would have just spent their money. So just as a quick example, um, this guy here has five dollars or five pounds uh, and instead of spending some money on a glass of lemonade he says I think I'm gonna save my money um, and because lots of people are doing this because everyone's trying to save more money um, the guy here owns the lemonade stand uh, decides he's not actually selling enough anymore so he has to close his stand so now this guy, uh, the guy who owns the lemonade stand, is going to uh, have less income. He's going to spend less money on, perhaps, perhaps he's going to spend less money on shops where this guy who's going to buy the lemonade works. So now he has less income. Uh, it, employees of that company might get laid off or they have, might have lower wages than otherwise. So everyone sort of ends up, uh, ends up worse off. Uh, and this... Can, see, uh, can be seen quite easily on a small, uh, small scale with a supply and demand diagram where when the demand falls for a good uh, people buy less of it the price also lowers um, so again if, if you're if you're a business uh, a big business and you employ lots of people and you start selling less stuff uh, and you're making lower profit because your prices are lower then you're likely to get rid of some of your employees or pay them less so the way this works in relation to monetary policy um, is that when the high, uh, interest rates are high uh, people will save lots of their money, they'll put lots of money away in a bank uh, so they're doing this instead of spending it uh, on headphones, a new pair of shoes uh, whatever they might spend it on uh, and entrepreneurs like our guy who had the lemonade stand is not going to be able to take out a loan um, you might think well people are uh, saving lots of money the banks have money, lots of money to give out but they're charging high interest rates which means that he won't be able to afford to pay back his loan so he won't be able to uh, invest in more efficient equipment I don't really know much about making lemonade so I don't know what that might be um, but on the flip side when we've got low interest rates people aren't going to save their money as much instead they're going to spend it um, in addition to this the low interest rates means that uh, our happy guys at the lemonade stand might be able to invest in better equipment even though they couldn't before so now there's more demand for their stuff and they can afford to take out loans to set up maybe a second shop hire a second employee to expand the business so this is really good for our economy on the other hand a high interest rate uh, might not be so high in, uh, overall high interest rates contract an economy whilst low interest rates help it to grow and expand um, so the way uh, this works in relation to the Bank of England is that um, it lends money to all other banks like uh, Santander, Nationwide and the base rate is the interest rate the Bank of England charges these other banks to, uh, to borrow money. So these other banks are going to use this as a benchmark for what they, um, for what they charge us for our, if we want to borrow money from them. So the Bank of England is sort of in control. Uh, of what interest rates are through this. So I mentioned earlier we'd be looking at aggregate supply. Um, so as you can see here I've got a dotted line and this represents our maximum level output because at some point um, we can't produce any more goods or services. We might run out of teachers for example so no matter how high the demand for education until we actually train more, uh, train more people to teach then it doesn't matter how much people are willing to pay, we're not going to get more teachers because there just aren't any. So 
when demand is uh, aggregate demand, which is the total demand in an economy, is intersecting our supply curve at quite a high point, uh, the Bank of England might want to uh, stop inflation becoming too high. It wants to prevent hyperinflation. So what it will do is it will raise interest rates, and that should have this effect here, where our aggregate, uh, our aggregate demand shifts downwards. People are, uh, are willing to pay less for certain goods and services. Um, so although our actual real GDP, how much stuff we're selling, hasn't really changed much, we've got quite a big dip in prices, in price levels. So we're preventing that hyperinflation. On the other hand, uh, our aggregate demand might be somewhere over here, in which case lowering the interest rate is going to shift the demand up to somewhere where there's not much change in price, we haven't got much inflation, but we're really helping to expand the economy. So this sort of happens in cycles as our aggregate supply and demand uh, fluctuate. So there are a few criticisms of the idea of the paradox of thrift. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, if people save more, then uh, banks have more money to lend people. Uh, especially if the interest rates don't change, if people are just saving more, then surely banks are going to lend more to businesses. Um, the uh, th reason I think this is wrong is that banks actually only typically have about 10 to 20% of the money uh, available to them uh, compared to how much people have saved. Um, I don't know how well I worded that, but essentially, um, let's say everyone in the UK, about 70 million people, had £10 billion uh, invested in banks, they'd put it away in a savings account. The uh, banks are only likely to actually have, like, have money available to them, about 1 or £2 billion. Uh, obviously, it's not that they just don't have enough money, they've got something like £20 billion, uh, out in loans. I don't know these actual figures. Um, but I do know the percentage is about right, but 10 to 20%. So I disagree with the first point. Uh, but I think this second one's quite a good one. So people will spend the money they have saved later on. Uh, so they might put a deposit on a house, buy a new car. They may even use it to pay for tuition fees at university. So it, essentially, the demand may suffer now. But because more pe some people are saving, some people are spending. Uh, it sort of cancels each other out. So we have a dip in demand now and an expansion in demand at a later date. And because these coincide with each other, where lots of people save, lots of people spend, uh, nothing bad really happens. But again, this, um, as it, like the premise of the actual paradox of thrift is uh, very unrealistic because you're not going to have everyone go out and put all their money in a bank and stop spending money. But in a hypothetical situation where the, uh, that did occur, then if everyone decided to spend their money later, they wouldn't really have much uh, to spend the money on because the, but lots of businesses have shut down. So in that, that's kind of the idea of the paradox of thrift. It's just showing, it's just showing a hypo what would happen in a hypothetical situation. So it's not really real. It wouldn't really ever happen, but it, it demonstrates how, uh, how misleading, like how our attitudes towards saving can, uh, saving money can be a little bit um, misguided and inaccurate. How how they can shape how we think about the economy. Oh, wrong side there. The video's not quite over yet. Sorry. Um, so yeah, I'll finish off on negative externalities briefly. So they're just the negative effects you have on other people when you consume a good or produce something. So, for example, when you drive a car, you um, you cause pollute, you pollute the atmosphere, and other people have to suffer the consequences of that pollution. Same, say, if you have a party or play uh, music loud at night, uh, other people have to deal with the fact that you're being very loud and disrupting their sleep. Uh, so, in context of saving, when you put money away in a bank, you may benefit because you earn interest on it, and you can then use it later on to buy something you really want. So. To you, a university education, um, let's say that costs you £60,000 in all in all because you have to pay for accommodation and living costs as well as tuition fees. You, you'll probably find you get more use out and utility out of that, more, more benefits from that than, um, say, 100,000 Mars bars. So you, you're going to benefit a lot, but others experience the negative side effects. So businesses lose out on sales uh, and then their employees in turn suffer. So... Again, back to back to the paradox of thrift. If 
you save you don't feel the negative effects because you're, you're just reaping the benefits others are feeling your negative externalities but if everyone else then also saves money then the um, the externalities outweigh uh, the benefits so everyone's worse off and that's just kind of the idea that the paradox of thrift is, is demonstrating uh, so that's everything I'm gonna cover in this video thank you uh, if you're still here thank you very much for watching uh, if you really like this video then please give it a like so it can reach more people help promote my content and it also lets me know which videos I should make more of um, so videos that get lots of likes I'm gonna make more of those because uh, I know people are actually enjoying them uh, Another way to support is by subscribing, uh, so it can help my channel grow and build a bigger community. And it will, you'll also get notified of future videos so if you enjoyed this one. Hopefully you'll enjoy others I make. But the most helpful thing you can do for this channel is to write a comment giving me feedback and suggestions so that I know what content I should actually be making, what content people actually want to watch. Anyway, thank you so much for watching this video. I plan on making a few more that are similar to this um, by using... Uh, just random sort of questions and ideas that you wouldn't normally find in a syllabus but then using them to explain uh, certain concepts and topics that are in syllabuses so it's a little bit interesting uh, and answers some questions you might have or things you've been wondering about but at the same time it can still cover some stuff that you might need for your exam see you in the next video